Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring James Mason and Pamela Colino in Five Fingers. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we bring you the true story of a man who committed one of the most infamous of crimes. A clever spy who sold his services to the highest bidder. It's 20th Century Fox's drama of Five Fingers, directed by my friend Joe Mankiewicz. Five Fingers, which opened a safe containing top-secret documents. And starring in his original role will be James Mason. We are delighted to welcome Pamela Colino to our stage to co-star with her husband in Five Fingers. And speaking of Five Fingers, remember it just takes the tips of your fingers to cream that gentle Lux lather into your skin. Watch what its wonderful skin tonic action can do for your complexion. Yes, Lux Toilet Soap can make your skin smoother, fresher, and give you that radiantly alive look that comes from your daily Lux Toilet Soap Facials. Now, Five Fingers, starring James Mason as Diello and Pamela Colino as Countess Davisca. This account begins in 1944. The war was at its height, but some nations still were neutral. Among them, Turkey. One evening early in March, an attaché of the German embassy at Ankara, a man named Moisic, was about to enter his quarters when a stranger appeared from out of the shadows. Whatever you do, don't raise your voice. Who are you? What do you want? Take me to your office. Either you tell me who you are... Don't be a fool. I've brought you the opportunity of a lifetime. I can make you the envy of the entire German foreign service. Now, open the door. The stranger was in his middle thirties, well-dressed and as Moisich soon found out, exceedingly sure of himself. Let me warn you, Moisich, not one word of this must reach anyone except your ambassador. My life will depend on your discretion. A responsibility I do not choose to accept. I'm afraid you have no choice. Your life will depend upon it, too. You see, certain British documents classed as most secret have come into my possession. The price is 20,000 pounds, English pounds sterling. 20,000? Who are you? I am a spy, obviously. I'm also a businessman. And you consider it sound business to pay 20,000 pounds to an unidentified amateur for a set of so-called secret documents? Not so-called, not secret. I said most secret. You will inform Herr von Papen of my offer. Naturally, he'll have to check with Berlin. I'll telephone you on Friday for his answer. I must have more information. If you accept, I'll return at 7 o'clock Friday evening with two rolls of film containing photographs of the documents. And I will receive from you the sum of 20,000 pounds in English banknotes. For each subsequent roll of film, the price will be 15,000 pounds. Is this clear? It is not clear at all. What documents? Containing what? For one thing, the English have been discussing with the Turks their possible participation in the war. A matter of pure supposition. I have the minutes of their secret talks. Your ambassador, Herr von Papen, would find them enlightening and frightening. What else? The latest Allied plans for the shuttle bombing of certain Balkan targets. When and by whom and how many. Go on. Don't be greedy, Moisich. What do you expect for 20,000 pounds? How did you obtain such information? That is no concern of yours, nor is my identity. And please, do not have me followed. You Germans have no talent for it. You keep wanting to get ahead of the people you follow. Yes, destiny extends its hand to you. Take it and hold on. Good night, Moisich. The man left. Moisich did not have him followed. But had he done so, he would have discovered that his visitor was in the employ of the British Embassy, the ambassador's valet. And like any proper valet, he was at his post when the ambassador returned shortly before midnight from a reception. A pleasant reception, sir? Diplomatic receptions are never pleasant to yellow. The faces may be, but never the motives. Your coat, sir. Allow me. Uh, speaking of pleasant faces to yellow, at one time, weren't you in the service of the Countess Tabiska? I was the valet to her late husband, sir, at the court of St. James. 
She was at the reception. Is she well, sir? It's charming and lovely as ever, but not so well off. The Nazis in Poland have confiscated everything she owns. I'm sorry to hear it, sir. She was a lady of great wealth. And she used it well. More than anyone I have ever known, Countess Tadiska symbolized the world in which she lived. A world of beauty and luxury. Gone forever, I'm afraid. Let us hope not, sir. I put the survey of Turkish manganese beside your bed, together with your journal. Oh, yes. Thank you. That will be all, Diello. One moment, sir. Your capsule. Diello, have you ever considered the possibility that you might, just for once, forget something? Often, sir. I don't think you'd ever get over it. <laughs> Nor do I. Good night, Your Excellency. <laughs> Three days later, the German ambassador, Franz von Papen, sent for his aide, Moisich. He had just received a dispatch from Berlin. Well, it's here, Moisich. Read it. Transaction approved. Take every precaution. Essential, you determine identity of agent. Expect immediate report. It was sent by Carlton Brunner. Well, here's the money. 20,000 pounds. There's no need to count it, Moisich. I have not taken any of it. Oh, sir, but I had no intention... Believe me, I was just... Are you sure you can handle this alone? Oh, yes, sir. And I can develop the film myself. Good. The fewer people who know about this, the better. Particularly if this fellow makes fools of us. What was your impression, Moisic? Arrogant, spoiled, cynical. A British aristocrat, if ever I saw one. <laughs> Fantastic. And by the way, a code name has been assigned to him. He is to be referred to as Cicero. The name is the personal choice of Herr Ribbentrop. Has it any significance, sir? None that I know of, except the surprising fact that Herr Ribbentrop had even heard of Cicero. Uh, he'll uh, be here tonight? He said seven o'clock, sir. Keep your wits sharp. A great deal depends on you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Marzic. Uh, yes, Your Excellency? The money here. You forgot it. Your Excellency. <laughs> Promptly at seven o'clock, Diello arrived at Moisich's office. On the desk lay the pile of banknotes. Ah, you have the money, I see. Thank you, Moisich. It's a film. Here, two rolls. Oh, fetch me a drink while I count it, will you? Scotch whiskey, please. I'm sure you must have some. We have the best of everything. One of the pleasures of duty in a neutral country. You Germans can drink fine Scotch whiskey, and your enemies can fill up on fine German beer. You can count the money later. It goes into the safe until I have developed the film. Are you going to develop the film yourself? Yes. There is a dark room down the hall. Then perhaps you'd better drink this. You're trembling like a butterfly. You will remain here until I come back. I'll lock the door. I won't let anyone in but you. Now hurry. Moisich was stunned by the contents of the film as well he might have been. Back in his office, he did his best to hide his excitement. Interesting snapshots, aren't they? Sir... The documents seem to be genuine. Don't be pompous, Moisich. My government has authorized me to make further arrangements with you. Splendid. 15,000 pounds for each additional roll of film. Oh, and about my present fee. I've counted the money. It was all there. That money is in the safe. It was. You opened the safe. It's open. You see, I said to myself, if I were an ambitious attaché like Moisich, what would be the combination of my safe? How dare you? And the answer... 1 30, 33, the day Hitler came to power. I imagine that would open half the safes in Germany. What an unimaginative lot you are. Well, don't be upset, Moisich. There was nothing else worth taking. My, my government is prepared to pay 10,000 pounds per roll. No more. We won't haggle. I risk my life to get these photographs. My price is quite reasonable. You'll pay it. Not until we know who you are and how you obtain such information. That is my business. I will tell you this. I work at the British Embassy... Sooner or later, you'll find that out anyway. You... You have been assigned a code name. Cicero. Cicero. A man of nobility, eloquence, and dissatisfaction. I like that name. When will you bring more film? A week from tonight. Have the money ready. Oh, and uh, change the combination of your safe. May I suggest one? Try 61815. That's the date of the Battle of Waterloo. Good night, Moisich. <laughs> Diello left. Then he took a walk which led him to a rather shabby section of the town and to a rooming house, the quarters of Countess Anna Staviska. 
Oh, it's you, Diallo. Well, come in. Do I disturb you, madam? Not at all. Fortunately, I have a dinner engagement, but he is an undersecretary and he's used to waiting. Any particular undersecretary, madam? Undersecretaries are never particular, Diallo. Perhaps that's why they take me to dinner. It is far more likely that in madam's presence they feel like ambassadors. Of all the diplomats I've ever known, you're still the best. It is my good fortune that you have known so few valets. Diallo, please. I've spoken to you before about this. You're the valet to the British ambassador, not to me. Now sit down and tell me the gossip. I'll begin with the British ambassador, madam. He finds you the most radiant, the most sought-after lady in Ankara. To him, you are the symbol of everything worth having and wanting. The symbol of the good old days. That's me. You see this, Diallo? An emerald. The last of the lot. I want you to take this to the pawn shop tomorrow. I... I couldn't face another trip. Would it not be pleasant to make just one more trip, madam? This time to redeem your jewels? Redeem? With English pounds. Here. Where did you get that money? It's yours. Five thousand pounds. But it can't be real. There's nothing as real as money. But I may never be able to pay this back. I don't want it back. But I can't permit you. Why, it must be the savings of a lifetime. Not savings, madam. I'm not a savings saving man. A business venture of mine has paid off handsomely. But what has it to do with me? I propose to advance you 5,000 pounds in return for certain favors. I have here another 15,000. I couldn't possibly keep such sums at the embassy, nor do I want to draw attention to myself by depositing into my, in a bank. But you, madam, you could keep it for me. Go on, dearly. You could leave this grubby room, rent an attractive villa, live as you please. But how would all this be a favor to you? From time to time, I shall want to transact my business in privacy. You would set aside certain quarters for me. I see. If all goes well, I shall have some 200,000 pounds within 12 weeks. That's the amount I've set as my goal. And then? South America. A new life, a new name. That, of course, will require a passport, visas, letters of credit. You could be of great help to me in obtaining them. How? I'll explain that when the time comes. Is there anything else? Nothing. Except all I've told you must remain extremely confidential. Seems little enough to ask for 5,000 pounds. Are you going to tell me what your business is? Sometime, perhaps. Not now. This is quite a trust you put in me. You seem very sure of yourself. I'm sure of you, madam. Oh? For three years, I was valid to your late husband. It is said that no man is a hero to his valet. It is also true that no woman is a mystery to her husband's valet. You know me that well? Well enough. The source of your money has never concerned you any more than the source of your electric light. They became worrisome only when they were shut off. Quite true. But there's pride. I have pride. A great deal. I depend on your pride. You'll find it intolerable to have it known that your wealth was the gift of a servant. So, you will keep your mouth shut tight. Get me a brandy. There, on the table. Of course. No, Diallo. Not two glasses. I shall drink only out of one, thank you. Do you know why I discharged you after my husband died? I think I do, madam. Because you made me uneasy. I felt you had an evil genius for something. Little did I know it was for making money. That's a lie. That wasn't why I made you uneasy. No? No. You were attracted to me. It was upsetting to feel that way about a valet and to feel that the valet knew it all the time. Have I offended you? You'll soon be very rich. Everything worth having and wanting. The ambassador didn't say that about you. I did. That's how I've always thought about you. And now you want me to go with you to South America? Yes. Away from the war, the intrigues, the fears. And the poverty. And it would be right for us now. Because now, now at last, we are equals. Yes. Equals. Who's lying now, Diallo? Where are you going? Madam has a dinner engagement, and we seem suddenly to have run out of gossip. You made me a business proposition. I agree to that part of it. As for the rest, it's not an impossibility. It's merely an improbability, and above all, an impertinence. Because I address you as an equal? No. Because you address me as a servant. Because in the manner of an inferior, you tried to buy something you didn't think you merited on your own. Now, let us get down to the details of business. As Madam wishes. My name is Anna. Yes, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. 
It was inevitable, of course, that the British Embassy would discover that many of their carefully guarded secrets were now known to the Nazis. When this disturbing news reached London, a counter-espionage agent named Travers was sent to the ambassador at Ankara. We've made all sorts of preliminary checks, Mr. Travers. So far, we've failed. I haven't the slightest idea how the German embassy is getting this information. And if I were to assume that the source is someone here, here at the embassy, sir? But all our personnel and permanent employees have had security clearance from London. You'll forgive me, but I've never known a self-respecting spy without security clearance. Uh, where do you store your state papers, sir? Right here in my study, in uh, that safe. Uh-huh. And what about the code room? McFadden can answer that. Code room is under constant guard night and day. Sir Frederick, don't you think that this lamentable lapse in security could be due to a slip of the lip at some party or reception? My lips are not in the habit of slipping, Mr. Travers. Uh, nor do I imply that they are, sir, but uh, our secret information does pass through other hands. It might pass through other lips. Now, uh, McFadden's been telling me about an unattached lady, a certain Countess Staviska. Uh, it is possible, is it not, that... I beg your pardon, Your Excellency. What is it, Yellow? It's time for your capsule, sir. Oh, thank you, Yellow. Just set it down. Yes, sir. You were saying, Travers? Your valet? Yes. He's been with me for years. Ah. Well, about the Countess, according to McFadden, her circumstances have taken a startling change for the better. Does anyone know the source of her sudden good fortune? I'm not able to answer that. However, she has many friends on either side, the Lied and Axis. Hmm. Now, by the way, you'll be interested to know that I'm not the only newcomer to Ankara. Colonel von Richter was also on the train from Istanbul. Von Richter? The Gestapo? Yes, traveling under a Swiss passport. He calls himself Rudolf Hodler, a tobacco buyer from Bern. He went directly to the German embassy, sir. No doubt he's reporting to von Papen, as I am reporting to you, sir. If we only knew what they're saying. Yes, Sir Frederick, if we only knew. Von Papen's reception of von Richter was anything but cordial. Von Papen had good reason to be aroused. So, you come here seeking confirmation of the documents we bought from Cicero. You've had your confirmation on the 5th of April. We sent you the British plans to bomb the Poleski oil fields. Well, well, they bombed the weren't they? Thousands of dead, millions of gallons of precious oil destroyed. What is the price of confirmation, Herr von Richter? Regarding Cicero, it remains the opinion of General Kaltenbrunner and myself that all this still could be a British trap. Now then, you seem very certain about a connection between the Countess de Visca and Cicero. May I ask why? Because it is obvious. Why else would he choose her new home for his next meeting with Moisich? What a strange and sudden and perfect relationship. Too strange, too sudden and too perfect. The unknown Cicero and the well-known Countess, well known for her anti-German sentiments. Yet only a month ago, she pleaded with me for an opportunity to work in our interests. For love, Herr von Poppen, or for money? For money, of course. A loan until the time when we return her property we've confiscated in Poland. I want to talk to Cicero myself. Moisish, when do you meet with him next? Uh, Thursday evening, Herr Colonel. Then you will arrange for Mr. Hodler, the Swiss businessman, to be present. On Thursday night, the Countess Tavisca was again entertaining. Among her guests was the tobacco buyer from Switzerland. During the evening, she led him through the house to a secluded wing where someone was waiting for him. You will find your man in that room, Monsieur Hodler. I shall see that you are not disturbed. Thank you, madame. Are you too a diplomat, monsieur, like Herr Moisich? I suppose you could call me a middleman. There are so many Swiss middlemen. It seems to be a national occupation. What could be more natural? After all, the Swiss have been in the middle for hundreds of years. <laughs> Just knock on the door, monsieur. Colonel von Richter, sit down, please. Moisich tells me you are to be the new intermediary. That is correct. Moisich is too well known here. It will be safer for me to deal with you. I'm happy to hear it. I share your concern. The Countess, have you told her who I am? Of course not. Does she know the nature of your business? No. Then just what is her relation? My dear Colonel, I didn't invite you here to discuss my personal affairs. 
We have some business to transact. Did you bring the money? You will be paid after we have developed the film. During the past weeks, I have sold Moisage 50 photographs, all of genuine secret documents. That's proof enough of my good faith. Henceforth, you will pay on delivery. No? Well, possibly you're no longer interested in the strategic plans of the Allies for the entire Mediterranean area. The second front? I do not know the number of the front. I do know that in these documents, Mr. Churchill keeps referring to the soft underbelly of Europe. Of course, I could take the films to von Papen and ask that he himself query the German high command as to their interest. Very well. Here. Fifteen thousand pounds. Why, you had it with you all the time. Who are you, anyway? If I told you I was, um, the valet to the British ambassador, would you believe me? Certainly not. <laughs> you see... At least tell me why you are selling us this information. I thought that was self-evident for money. But you must have some other motive. Perhaps you share our disgust with British decadence. If I have a disgust for anything, it is for poverty. You sell us information which will help us win the war, yet you insist upon being paid in money with a very dubious future. British pounds. What makes you think I think Germany will win the war? Apart from the money we pay you, you attach little importance to these documents. Why? In the first place, I cannot sell you the intelligence to make the proper use of them. In the second place, by informing a man about to be hanged of the exact size, location, and strength of the rope, you do not remove either the hangman or the certainty of his being hanged. And now I'm sure you will want to rejoin the party. One week from tonight, I shall have more film for you. Good night, Colonel. <laughs> I trust your meeting was a happy one, Monsieur Hodler? Quite satisfactory, thank you. And you will honor us soon again? The honor will be mine. Good night, madame. <sighs> How charmingly you Swiss click your heels. Good night, monsieur. <laughs> Act Two of Five Fingers, starring James Mason as Diello and Pamela Colino as the Countess. Two weeks went by. The man known to the British as Diello the Valet and to the Nazis as Cicero the Spy continued his audacious operations. How did he get his information? Months before, he had learned the combination of the safe in the ambassador's study. Removing the documents, he would place them under a lamp. But the ordinary electric light bulb was not bright enough. So he would substitute a much more powerful one and then, with a tiny pocket camera, quickly photograph each new document. In a matter of moments, the papers would be back in the safe and the original bulb restored to the lamp. Simple and incredibly bold and bound sooner or later to be discovered. But not yet. No, not yet. Come in, DLO. Another profitable evening? Profitable enough to bring the total to 75,000 pounds. Why don't you stop now? Why go on playing with fire? What makes you think I am? Oh, don't treat me like an idiot child. Your friend Hodler, he isn't Swiss. I know a Prussian when I see one. Does it matter to you? Your safety matters to me. My security depends upon yours. Forgive me. I keep thinking of myself as a man. I keep forgetting I'm a valet who pays dividends. I can't see why a man as rich as you should go on pressing the trousers of the British ambassador. That's where I get my money. I steal the loose change from his pockets. Before you go, get me a drink, will you? Tell me, where do you plan to settle when you go to South America? Real. There's no city like it in the world. When did you decide to go there? Many years ago. I was a cabin boy on a dirty tramp steamer. I can remember looking up at a villa high on the mountainside above the harbor. I could see a man on a balcony. He was wearing a white dinner jacket. He seemed close enough to touch, and yet he was beyond the reach of anyone. I swore then that someday I would be that man. My drink, please. Do you have a nationality, Diello? You're not a native Englishman, are you? Albanian. English by adoption. In England, it seemed profitable to become a gentleman, so I went into service. As you have pointed out, I am not yet a gentleman. But I am the best of the gentlemen's gentlemen, which reminds me the ambassador will be wondering what has kept me. And what will you tell him? Yes, yes, Anna? What shall I tell him? I shall tell him that I was uh, detained by a Turkish chambermaid. 
I think that you sh I shall find Rio very much to my liking. You have waited a long time to kiss me. You don't have to wait any longer. Anna. Yes, Diallo? Get me a drink. During the following weeks, Diello's fortune grew to 155,000 pounds. And yet, despite the unerring accuracy of the information which he sold to the Germans, they stubbornly and amazingly refused to act upon it, still afraid that Diello was really a British agent. At the British Embassy, Travers, the counter-espionage officer, continued on the merry-go-round which had led him exactly nowhere. But one morning, he asked the ambassador to send for Diello. We feel you can help us, Diello. After all, you were valid to the husband of Countess Daviska for some time. I'm sure you learned more about both of them than we could in a lifetime of investigation. Infinitely more, Mr. Travers. Well, then tell me, did you ever hear the Countess express sympathy for the Nazis? To my knowledge, the Countess never spoke of countries or of political parties, sir. The world to her was made up of individual people whom she either liked or disliked. Well, would you consider her to have been pro-German? The Countess was capable of being pro-anything, sir, if it made for a congenial dinner party. Hmm. Then you would consider it possible for her to have become a German agent, hmm? Only for money, sir. Of which she has suddenly acquired a most generous supply. <laughs> I know nothing about spies, of course, but, but I can remember that the Countess had a remarkable talent for receiving confidences from important people. The late Count always relied upon her for acquiring information. Thank you, dear Lennon. That's all. Oh, uh, I'll be dining at the American Embassy. You may take the evening off. Thank you, sir. Clever chap. He told us nothing. And the fact remains that von Papen still anticipates every move I make. Well, Travers, no argument? No, Your Excellency. No argument. That same evening, Colonel von Richter was once again at Countess de Visca's home, meeting with Diello. Nervous tonight, Colonel? Is something troubling you? This house is far too dangerous a meeting place for us. I wouldn't be surprised if the British were watching it. Not yet, but they will. They suspect the Countess is a German agent. Are you serious? And all the while you suspected she was a British agent. Amusing, isn't it? We should never have met here. From now on, we won't. Do you know the Aslan Hane Mosque in the old quarter? Moisich will find it for you. We'll meet there a week from tonight. A week is too long. It must be sooner. Really? Why? Because there is something about which we must secure information as quickly as possible. A certain code word has appeared in several of the documents you brought us last week. The word is Overlord. And we are convinced that Overlord is the name for their so-called Second Front. What we must know is the place and the date, the where and the when. I can understand your curiosity. I'll pay you well for it. Forty thousand pounds. Generous of you. But is information of that nature likely to turn up at the British Embassy in Ankara? Don't you read the documents you sell us? I photograph everything that's stamped secret, most secret, and top secret. I'm not particularly interested in what they contain. You photographed a dispatch last week stating that the ambassador would receive a copy of the revised strategic plan for Overlord within ten days. Forty thousand pounds, you said? For the where and the when. Hmm... We'll meet at the Aslan Hane Mosque on Thursday night. Bring the money with you. In the morning, Mr. Travers, for the first time, had some good news for the ambassador. The British had succeeded in breaking the diplomatic code of the Nazi ambassador, von Papen. And now, for a change, sir, you can eavesdrop on von Papen. All right, McFadden, will you read the message? This is from von Papen, sir, to the Reich Foreign Minister in Berlin. In reply to your query concerning the authenticity of documents obtained from Cicero, I am firmly convinced the material is genuine. Cicero lives within the British Embassy. Obviously, he has access to top-secret information. Lives here? Kaltenbrunner's failure to evaluate the documents and von Richter's refusal to make them available to me is a tragic blunder. I strongly urge you to bring this matter to the personal attention of the Fuhrer without delay, signed von Papen. Cicero. That's the code name for their informer, sir. And now, with your permission, I'll order a house search at once. Uh, but an open search will put him right on his guard. It can't be helped. If we can't catch him, we've got to frighten him. 
Enough to make him stop for a while. As you know, I'm expected in Cairo tomorrow evening. Until I return, take any security measure you think necessary. Well, for one thing, sir, I suggest the combination on your safety changed and safety devices installed. A dozen members of the staff here have access to most of your secret documents. There's also McFadden and you and I. Cicero could be any one of us. Yes, sir. Any one of us. Well, McFadden, you better start changing that combination. How long will it take? In a few days, sir, but I can install an alarm bell in a matter of hours. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. About your trip to Cairo, shall I pack your uniforms? I won't be needing them. Thank you, Diello. Very well, sir. I'll close your bags. Uh, by the way, Diello, don't be upset if these gentlemen ransack my quarters while I'm gone. There'll be no need for that, I'm sure, sir. <laughs> On Thursday night, Moisic and von Richter appeared as scheduled at the entrance of the Aslan Hane Mosque. But the man they were looking for was not there. He has never been late before, never. Could it be possible, sir, that the British have found him out? It is more possible that the British have known about him all the time. It is very curious how easily Cicero acquired the documents he wanted to sell, and how when only once we name the information we want to buy, how mysteriously he fails to deliver it. What does the colonel propose to do now? Precisely nothing. All spies and time outlive their usefulness. I'm afraid, Moisish, that your friend Cicero has just about outlived his. Now, drive me back to the embassy. No, Diello did not appear that night at the mosque. He went instead to call on the Countess de Visca. So you can be very proud of me, Diello. You have everything you asked for, your passport, your visas, and your tickets. Your name is now Roberto Antonini. Well done, Signora Antonini. It was nothing. One of my many pleasant wifely duties. How much did they cost? Five thousand pounds. Another thousand for birth and marriage certificates. And the tickets? Two first-class compartments, separate cars on the Istanbul Express leaving tomorrow evening. And the ship? An Argentine passenger freighter sailing from Istanbul directly to Rio. Day after tomorrow at sundown. Now remember, you're to take no notice of me whatsoever on the train. When we reach Istanbul, we'll go aboard the ship at once. How does it go at the bank? The size of the deposit created quite a stir. The manager seemed extremely curious. But the papers will be ready tomorrow morning. How much? Another thousand. And all my powers of persuasion, this side of respectability. That leaves roughly 130,000 pounds. In dollars, about 600,000. In Brazilian cruceros, about uh, 11 and a half million. Plus the 40,000 you got tonight. No, I withdrew from that transaction. The market's getting shaky. I've decided to retire. You have before you an Argentine gentleman of leisure about to take up residence in Brazil. I'm glad. We have more than enough anyway. We? We have more than enough? My dear Senora Antonini, where I come from, a man's money is his own. And if his wife is a good wife, he gives her some from time to time. <laughs> Whatever you say, Roberto... Will you miss being a countess? Not for a moment, darling. Not for a moment. In the morning, Mr. Travis, for the first time, had reason to specifically question the ambassador's valet. Oh, dear, hello. May I ask what you're doing with those letters? Please, sir. Mr. Morrison gave them to me. The ambassador's personal mail, sir. Oh, I see. Perhaps you'd better take charge of it, sir, until he returns from Cairo. Yes, I think we'd better put it in the safe. Um, how many letters are there? Five, sir. Mm-hmm. Well, this one seems quite personal. Lady's handwriting. You were looking at it, weren't you? It's perfumed, sir. And it struck me as such a pity that so few ladies use perfumed letter paper these days. By the way, dear Lowe, weren't you away from the embassy last night between nine and ten? Yes, sir. Would you mind accounting for your movements? Not at all, sir. I walked for a while on the boulevard, stopped for a drink at the Yuxel Palace, then back to the embassy. Huh. Uh, one other question about the countess. Do you remember any particularly close friends she may have had in Switzerland? Or did she go there often? Oh, very often, sir. She was extremely fond of Switzerland. Oh, well, then that explains it. Uh, countess Tavisca left by plane for Switzerland this morning. I hope she can enjoy it in the style to which she is accustomed. Oh, that shouldn't be any problem. She took with her 130,000 pounds. I wonder where she got it. Yes, I wonder, sir.
We'll continue with Act Three of Five Fingers in a few moments. The curtain rises on Act Three of Five Fingers, starring James Mason as Diello and Pamela Colino as the Countess. To Diello, the news was unthinkable. Anna Stavisca had stolen his money and gone to Switzerland. He hurried away from the embassy, went to a cafe, and telephoned Moisic. Listen carefully, Moisic. Tell Colonel von Richter I have decided to get the information about Overlord. I, uh, I need the money. But I'm being watched. I'll arrange a meeting place in Istanbul. I'll call you there tomorrow at the German consulate. That's about it, Travers. After the phone call, Diallo came directly back here to the embassy. But did you speak to anyone at the bar? No, no one. I think you're on the wrong track, sniffing after Diallo. After all, he didn't bat an eye when you told him about the countess. But why would he go to a cafe to make a telephone call? And then why did he... <sighs> no, maybe you're right. Where is he now? Upstairs. If he should leave again, he'll be followed, of course. Yes, Diallo was upstairs. Staring at the ambassador's safe and the newly installed wiring that led out to the hall to an electric alarm bell. In the safe was a secret worth 40,000 pounds, but one turn of the dial and the entire British embassy would descend upon him. But then he smiled. How simple it would be. Diello walked down the hall to a broom closet. In it was a fuse box. He removed the fuse that served the ambassador's study and thus broke the current to the alarm bell. Two minutes later, he was taking photographs of half a dozen papers containing the word Overlord. And then there was no time to return the documents to the safe, no time for anything but to find out who was at the door. What do you want? The porter, sir. I clean office now? No, not now. His Excellency won't be back until tomorrow. But it is not necessary... Not now, I said. Come back later. But the porter was not one to quickly surrender. If he could not tidy up the study, at least he could vacuum the carpets in the corridor. But when he turned on the vacuum cleaner, there was no electricity. So he went to the broom closet, observed that a fuse was missing, and promptly replaced it. That man, where did he go? Did you see him? Oh, what man? Who? That man. Well, get away. Where's the other, McFadden? He's not going out. The back stairway. He was chasing someone. All right, Johnson. You and Kimball follow him. Find him and stick with him. Morrison, get a dispatch off to London. I want all available information on Diallo sent here at once. All right, McFadden, come on. Let's have a look at the safe. <laughs> Papers are all here. Now, what about the letters, that batch of mail that came to the ambassador? There were five letters. One letter is missing, the one with the delicate perfume. Yes, one letter gone, but none of the papers. Now, I wonder why he... That light in the bedroom. Mm, lamp's on. Yes, it's an unusually bright lamp, isn't it? Come here. Photographic bulb. He's photographed... All right. It. Have Burroughs and Murray watch the German embassy. We've got to keep him from delivering that film. Grab him in public? Our Turkish friends might not like it. Well, if we can't kidnap him, McFadden, we'll have to kill him. There's a little matter of overlord we've got to consider. All right, must send out a man to the airport. After Johnson gets back, you and I will get out to the railroad station. If he doesn't show up at their embassy, you can be sure he's leaving town. <laughs> At the German embassy, Colonel von Richter was also making plans, based on Diello's phone call from the cafe to Moisic. He said he would arrange a meeting in Istanbul? Very well. Siebert, you and Sturben take the train. Moisic and I will go by plane. Cicero is bound to be on one or the other. Shall we go armed, Colonel? Naturally. You are to protect Cicero from the British at all costs until we get that film. And after that? After that, Moisic, it will be up to Cicero to protect himself from the British and from us. At the crowded railroad station, four men kept their tense watch for Diello. Two British and two Nazis. But there was no sign of Diello. Not until the train started to move from the platform. And then, from his hiding place, Diello dashed through the crowd and onto the train. Well, I... I 
gone through the last three cars. There's no sign of him. He's in the car just ahead, the second compartment. The door's closed. Well? Well, there's nothing to do between here and Infas to Istanbul, but make sure that none of them get off. Them? Yes, down there. The old, familiar faces. The same two we saw in the station. But what if he's given them the film? They wouldn't be playing watchdog for him if he did. So, uh, put your gun away, McFadden, and light up your pipe. A long ride to Istanbul. In his compartment, Diello was reading a letter. The letter with a delicate scent addressed to the British ambassador. And so, by the time you receive this letter, I shall be far from anger, far from uncertainty and hunger and humiliation. I shall be settled, I hope, in a new life of security and self-respect. You have spoken to me so often, my dear ambassador of Diello, the perfect valet. Surely I can offer no greater proof of my devotion to the Allied cause than to inform you that your trusted Diello is a German spy. I know both you and your government. Early the following morning, Diello left his compartment and entered another. Good morning, gentlemen. Did you sleep well? I slept extremely well. Guards to the right of me, guards to the left of me. You are my bodyguards, aren't you? Or are you my assassins? We are here to see that no harm comes to you from the British. We will stay at your side till we reach a German consulate. Don't be whimsical. I'm here only to give you a message from Moisej. Tell him to meet me at Hakim's restaurant at six o'clock this evening. We would prefer the consulate. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. So many more people go into German consulates than come out. We must have some guarantee that your film is genuine. Here is a little strip of film. Have Moisic develop it, and you will see a piece of the document that Colonel von Richter wants to buy. I'll deliver the rest of it when Moisic pays me 100,000 pounds. 100,000? Oh, I forgot to tell you. I've just raised the price. <laughs> At six o'clock in Istanbul, in a restaurant called Hakim's, Moisej kept his appointment with Diello. Some moments later, they were followed there by Travers and McFadden. Good evening, gentlemen. Do you wish a table? I'm looking for a friend. He, um, he'll be in a private room. That is a private room over there? It is occupied. Good. Then he's here. I am sorry. He does not wish to be disturbed. Ah, but he's expecting us. I am sorry. If you care to wait, please, to be seated here. Well, he's here, McFadden. And Moises is in there with him. There is a time for using your wits and a time for blasting away. Let's get it over with. We have no monopoly on blasting away in this place. Oh, Nazi friends again, eh? Yes, those dim-witted supermen over there would drop us before we got clear of the table. But he may be handing over the film this minute. Well, as of this minute, we don't want the film. Plans can be changed, you know. We want yellow. We've got to know just how much the Nazis have found out. Now, look, I'm going to send him a note, just a word or two, to let him know that we'll protect him. You're balmy, Travers. Oh, no, he'll jump at it. Uh, uh, you, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. My friend may not know that we're waiting for him. Would you give him this note, please? That, that note you just got, who is it from? What does it say? Ah, oh, you're troubled, Moisich. Is it because you know that I haven't much longer to live? The two Gestapo men are here to protect you from the British. What two men? Really, Moisic, you and your guilty conscience and your big mouth. Well, the money is all in order, and here is the film. Good. Has it occurred to you that our roles are now reversed, that the British may try to kill you? Well, Moisic, shall we go? He's heading toward us, Travers. Your note worked. Mr. Travers, I'm touched by your solicitude. Imagine me, of all men, with a British sword and a British shield. Personally, I'd rather slit your throat. Impractical. In that case, I'd be unable to tell you all the things you want to know. You've no idea how confused the Nazis are to see you protecting me. They still half suspect I've been a British plant all along. We have a car outside. We'll see you safely to the British consulate. No, no, thank you. We'll walk away together and then say goodbye. I get the Turkish police to arrest you. Is that a gun in your pocket, Mr. McFadden? It's against the law here to carry a weapon, don't you know? Come along. Of course. You disapprove of me, don't you, Mr. Travers? 
You're the most cold-blooded traitor I've seen in a lifetime of looking at human trash. What a pity. I rather hoped I looked like a gentleman. They left the restaurant. Behind them came the two Gestapo men, Siebert and Steuben. But Diello had known exactly what he was doing when he picked Hakim's as a meeting place, for the narrow street was jammed with people and traffic. They walked not more than 50 feet when he suddenly darted away and was lost in the crowd. <laughs> Meanwhile, Moisic had rushed to the German consulate with a roll of foam that had cost 100,000 pounds. The film is developed, Colonel. I have exactly the information you wanted. Have you? It took you long enough. I, I was so nervous, I, I spoiled the first print. But here, here it is, sir. D-Day for Operation Overlord is tentatively set for early June along the coast of Normandy and the Cherbourg Peninsula. Colonel, did you hear me? Now you hear this. An urgent dispatch from von Poppen. Von Poppen? Have just received personal letter from Countess Anna Staviska naming Cicero as British agent. Am unable to confirm accusation because Countess is now in Switzerland. But in view of past efforts to ingratiate herself with us, am compelled to believe her charge is true. I cannot believe it. I have always believed it from the first. But the documents were genuine. Events proved them genuine. Of course, they had to be, so that we would swallow that big lie, that one in your hand. I knew it. All along, I knew it. Lies, lies, lies! <laughs> Yes, Diello had won. As Roberto Antonini, he sailed away to Rio. He bought a magnificent home high on a hill overlooking the harbor, and he wore a beautiful white dinner jacket every night. But one evening, as his valet was serving dinner out on the balcony, two gentlemen came to call on him. This is an unexpected pleasure, Senor da Costa. May I present my friend, Senor Santos? I am honored, Senor. Are you, too, associated with the bank? No, senor. With the Brazilian Department of Investigation. And you have discovered some irregularity in my papers? Your papers are all perfectly in order. Uh, there is an irregularity, however. You, your account at the bank, senor. Am I overdrawn? As of yesterday, I had approximately seven million cruzeros in my account. I, I was referring to the 25,000 pounds in cash with which you purchased this video. The money has been returned. What on earth for? It is counterfeit. You have a distorted sense of humor, senor. So is the money which you exchanged for Brazilian currency. It is all counterfeit. The most skillful I have ever seen. Senor Antonini, I implore you to cooperate. Those counterfeit notes were printed in Germany. The British have just established that beyond a doubt. And so far they have turned up in three places. Here in Brazil, in Turkey, and in Switzerland. Switzerland? Over 100,000 counterfeit British pounds were confiscated there two days ago. In the possession of a political refugee, a lady, a countess. It will be to your interest, senor, to tell us where and how you got this money. Switzerland. Now, believe me, senor. <laughs> believe me, this is no laughing matter. <laughs> it is my unhappy duty to inform you you are under arrest. Anna. I beg your pardon. Anna. <laughs> Poor little Anna. <laughs> In a moment, our stars will return. And here they are coming forward for a well-earned call, James Mason and Pamela Colino. Jimmy, you were just great. But we're much happier to know you as you really are. After all, nobody likes a man masquerading as someone else. Oh, that's not necessarily true. Take Edmund Gwen. People love him whether he masquerades as Santa Claus or a counterfeiter. Or even an admiral. Teddy Gwen, an admiral? Yes, in 20th Century Fox's picture, Something for the Birds. Teddy co-stars with Vic Mature and Patricia Neal. And he plays an engraver who forges lovely invitations to parties and then attends as an admiral of the United States Navy. I know it'll be a comedy hit, Pamela, but I still prefer people who don't masquerade, like Lux girls. After all, you can't hide a Lux complexion. Well, who would want to? Particularly when Lux soap is such a wonderful complexion care. Ah, you're smart as well as beautiful, Pamela. Our audience knows you're a popular novelist as well as an actress. 
So have you written any new bestsellers? No, Irving. Since the success of O. Henry's Full House, I think I might try writing short stories, just like O. Henry did. Oh, I'd rather you wouldn't, dear. Remember, O. Henry wrote those stories in prison. <laughs> Who'd run the house and take care of Portland? It might be worth it, Jimmy. I once directed an O. Henry story for 20th Century Fox... And it became one of the first full-length talking pictures. I bet that was in old Arizona, which was nominated for one of the first Academy Awards. Yes, there's nothing like a good story and fine actors to make an outstanding picture. And that reminds me of next week's play. It's adapted from a best-selling novel and is the rollicking story of a different reactions of six convicts to a newfangled doctor called a psychologist. It's the Stanley Kramer production of My Six Convicts. And starring it as his original role will be that excellent actor, Millard Mitchell, and as the doctor, one of your very favorite stars, Dana Andrews. We won't miss it, Irving. Good night. Good Good night, night, Mr. and Mrs. Mason. Brand new stockings worn only a few times, yet suddenly you popped a run, and you never knew why. Has this ever happened to you? Well, look, you may be wearing out your stockings in the wash. Harsh washings in strong wash day soaps and detergents were never meant for delicate nylons. Cobweb sheer nylons just can't take it. Delicate nylons need special soap, special care, Lux Flakes care. Mmm, how nylons thrive on gentle washings in that silky Lux lather. Why, Lux Flakes care double stocking wear. It's just like getting an extra pair with every pair you buy. You see, gentle Lux Flakes care can't possibly cause runs, wash stocking life away. Fact is, each gentle washing in pure Lux Flakes has a special action that keeps nylon threads strong as new, washing after washing. Start using Lux Flakes tomorrow. 95% of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux, and it's guaranteed by Lever Brothers Company. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Dana Andrews and Millard Mitchell in My Six Convicts. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. And urging you as good Americans to vote in November. Heard in our cast tonight were Michael Pate as the narrator, Ben Wright as Travers, Edgar Barrier as von Richter, Stephen Roberts as Moisish, Bill Johnstone as von Poppen, Herbert Butterfield as Sir Frederick, Robert Griffith as McFadden, and Robert Boone, Larry Dobkin, and Eddie Marr. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett. Our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. Trust Silverdust. Trust Silverdust. Trust Silverdust to give you more for your money with a goodwill offer that's really a honey. Trust Silverdust. New improved Silverdust Wonder Bubble Suds for laundry and dishes now makes you this amazing goodwill offer. Inside every giant size Silverdust, you get, as an extra, a genuine full size Canon dish towel. Lint-free, highly absorbent, gay, colorful border, worth 25 cents or more. Remember, in giant-sized silver dust, you get this genuine full-size cannon dish towel as an extra. Try silver dust. See how it safely digs out dirt, gets clothes cleaner, speeds dishwashing, kind to your hands. Yes, silver dust, a great washing product with a cannon dish towel inside, gives you more for your money than any other washing product. That's guaranteed. Get the giant size box of silver dust with the big cannon dish towel as an extra today. Lever Brothers Company unconditionally guarantees the quality and performance of Lux Toilet Soap, Lux Flakes, Squalid and Toothpaste, and Silver Dust, or your money refunded. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear My Six Convicts, starring Dana Andrews and Millard Mitchell. This is the CBS Radio Network.